see. And if we're just dispassionate a bit and just look and observe at what's been going on in this century and in the last few years and indeed in the last few months, you can see that this structure is no longer something to predict, it's something you can actually see. And when anything that has remained hidden and has manipulated undercover um, is about to become physical reality, there is a window of time, and we're in it, when you start to see it in your face as these structures begin to appear. The idea is to have a world government to which nation states are administrative units, no power at all. That world government would administer a world central bank, a world currency, a world army, and a microchip population. Now the currency is designed eventually to be purely electronic, no cash. And when you look at the amount of cash in circulation that you can hold in your hand, it's dropping like a stone. And this is not to do with efficiency, it's to do with control. If you go into a shop or a garage now, and you hand over electronic money, a credit card, and they say, well, maybe so sorry, once accept your card, then at least you can still um, pay in another form. You still have to pay cash then, mate. What happens when no cash is in circulation, and that machine says no to your card? It means that whoever programs the computer is deciding if, when, whether you purchase. That's exactly the plan. And, of course, the credit card is designed to be replaced by the microchip, which I'll come to in a second. The World Army, as I've been writing in my books for years, and others have too, is designed to be NATO, predominantly being the world police force, fusing with the UN peacekeeping operation and, and other forces to create the World Army. And people say to me, well, what's the use of a World Army? If no one else has an army, there's no one to fight. Well, how about the people and anyone else who's trying to break out of the fascist state that would then be in place? Um, the microchip population. When I started talking about this, kind of years ago now, so many people just laughed in my face. Microchip people, don't be so bloody dead. Except now it's happening. And this guy with a patch on his chest I mentioned earlier, he said to me, just tell people, if they say no to one thing only, tell them to say no to the microchip. He said, because people who have realized microchipping is actually not has the best interest of humanity at heart, most of them have thought that it's about electronic tagging and knowing where people are. He said, on one level, of course, that's true, but that's not the real reason. He said, people don't realize the level of technology that operates outside the public domain. He said, first of all, microchips now are so small, they can be inserted in a hypodermic during a vaccination campaign. And interestingly, in the last few weeks, someone gave me a picture um, which came out of Huddersfield University in England of um, a massive, massive blow-up of an ant. And in its little pincers is a microchip. That's how small they are now. And he told me that years and years ago, or two years ago now. What he said was about microchips. is said they're designed to manipulate the mental and emotional processes of the human race. So that once we get a microchip inside us, whoever's controlling the pulses and connection to those microchips can lift people up en masse into aggressive states, into docile states, sexually um, uh, kind of arouse them, sexually suppress them. Any kind of mental and emotional state they can manipulate people to have. We will become literal robots. But of course that technology is not talked about in the public domain, so we don't think that's what it does, but this is what this guy said, it's all about. And there is a spiritual transformation going on. People are waking up all over the planet, it's a great time to be alive. The Illuminati know this. The Illuminati know about the cycles that are bringing this about, and they want to artificially suppress that awakening through microchipping before the big leap comes some years hence. Um, in line, I would, I think, with some of the uh, Maya um, uh, predictions of uh, transformation and human cycles. Under this is designed to be the European Union, which evolved out of a free trade area called the common market, the European Economic Community. We go into a free trade area and we get manipulated into the European Union, a fascist state. The American Union, the whole of the Americas, is designed to be an American version of that. And it's being evolved out of another free trade area in America called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. 
1994, Bill Clinton was at the meeting. The Pacific uh, Union um, uh, Trojan horse was created called the um, APEC, Asia Economic uh, Cooperation, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And under that um, is designed to come nation states and regions that have no power whatsoever. And the regions is interesting. One of the scams is to break nation states up into regions um, on, the, on the guise of devolving power. We want power to the people. We want regional government. Yeah. While at the same time, pushing real power further and further away from the people. They want to break nation states up so they can break up any unified response to this um, edifice of power. And of course, people come right underneath that. Now, if, if anyone's new to this stuff, I would say this. If you remember nothing about these hours this evening, then remember these two techniques I'm about to talk about because you get so streetwise so quick when you know these two. If someone came along openly and said, that's what we're going to do, there would be outrage from large numbers of people. That's a global fascist state. We're not having that. Come on. So, you manipulate the way people think and feel. So, not only do they not oppose that, they demand you do it. Or see it as the only solution to the problems they face. And that's the key. This is the technique that has advanced this agenda more powerfully and more efficiently than any other. I call it problem, reaction, solution. You know that's what you want to introduce. Say that structure, for instance. You know you're going to get an adverse reaction if you do it openly. So you start with stage one. You create a problem in the world. It could be a run on a currency, a government collapse, a stock market collapse at its most extreme, and we've seen some of them, a war. You then make sure someone else is blamed for that problem, so you, who have covertly created it, are not collared for it and identified with it. Because you've got to come out at stage three as a clean guy. You make sure the media report your manufactured problem in the way you want it reported so people perceive the problem in the way you want them to. And you want people to react to your problem in a way we hear all the time. This can't go on, something must be done. What are they going to do about it? Bloody politicians! Which allows you, after the problem, do something reaction, to then openly offer the solutions to the problems you have covertly created. And those solutions will be introducing the agenda which, if done openly, would have got an adverse reaction. Example. If at stage three, you want more power for the police, more armed police, more power to stop and search, more power to um, impose um, authoritarian rule on people, then at stage one, you need society to break down so there is more crime. You need to um, create some high-profile criminal events of your own, blamed on other people. So you get people in fear of being mugged, in fear of being burgled, in fear of walking in the street. And people in fear of anything will demand that someone protects them from what they've been manipulated to fear. So, do something, the crime rate, do something, look at this violence, solution, more authoritarian laws. A wonderful um, case of this was the Oklahoma bomb. 168 people killed, many of them children, in the James P. Murrah building on April the 19th, 1995. A person was blamed called Timothy McVeigh, who it was said um, planted a fuel fertilizer bomb in a rider truck. Well, how come then that bomb experts, including a guy called retired Brigadier General Ben Partin, who spent a lifetime in explosives in the military, have said publicly that not only did not that fuel fertilizer device demolish that um, vast building, it could not possibly have done so. The only way that building could have collapsed in the way it did, he says, is for high-tech devices some um, uh, with the same security clearance as nuclear weapons being on some of the pillars. And what was the solution to that problem? 
anti-terrorism bills went through Congress, taking away basic freedoms in America, purely and totally because of the Oklahoma bomb. And there was a, there was a, a Roman playwright called Seneca, something like that. Seneca, sounds like liver salt, doesn't it? Ooh, must have some Seneca. And he said something very profound in relation to this. He said, he who most benefits from a crime is the one most likely to have committed it. And if we apply that to Oklahoma, who benefited from Oklahoma? One group of people and one group of people only. Anyone that wanted to take away basic freedoms in America because they did it on the pretext of that bomb. And this is going on all the time. Especially with mind-controlled kids and mind-controlled killers who go crazy with guns that allow a problem to have a reaction and to have a solution. Why does Thomas Hamilton suddenly come to mind at Dunblane? Um, problem, reaction, solution can be um, shown never more clearly than in the Second World War. This is how wars operate. You had this global elite, this Illuminati, who um, created the Russian Revolution. This is well documented now. The way that uh, the Russian Revolution, Lenin and Trotsky, was um, funded through Wall Street and London. Some of the fundings being followed and found and some of the people who did it have been identified through research into this one area. Why would they do that? Because if you are going to create a problem, a war, you have to have two sides to create the problem. So you make them. You create them. You create the opposites that are really opposites. And this is another important point to um, operate and, and, and emphasize. If we see the world in black and white, well, we've friggin' lost the plot. It's not like that with the Illuminati, for this reason. If you want to control the outcome of a football match, and you control one side, you're not going to dictate the outcome before the game starts. You're going to influence the outcome because you control one side. If you control both sides, you can predict the result before the game starts. And so, they work through the far right, they work through the far left, they work through the far centre. They work through those opposing what they want to do, and they work through those who are um, promoting what they want to do. They want to control the game. And it's the subtleties and the shades of grey we have to find. The world is not black and white, not when the Illuminati are, are operating at some. So, by the time the Second World War was here, they had a front man in Russia called Joseph Stalin. In um, America, they had one of the great front men of the 20th century as uh, president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a bloodline, French aristocratic bloodline, one of the gang. And in Britain, by the time the real um, action started, they had one of the uh, offshoots of the Marlborough bloodline, Winston Churchill, whose image left us by history is a flipping farce as Prime Minister of Britain. Over here, that Teutonic Knight network and the uh, secret societies like the Brill Society, the Edelweiss Society, and the, um, the Thule Society, they had manifested the phenomenon known as Nazi fascism and Adolf Hitler. And then these oppo sames created and controlled by the same force were played off against each other to create the Second World War. At the end of the Second World War, People were, particularly in Europe, America too, were mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. You know, the, you know when they're mind controlling these kids? You know what they do? They get them mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. Because that's when people are most open to suggestion. And we have collective versions of that. We have trauma-based mind control on individuals and we have the trauma that I felt when I picked up a paper and saw what had happened to those kids in Dunblane. We are traumatized collectively also for exactly the same reasons. So, what did we say at that point collectively? Second World War in just a few years. This can't go on. Something must be done. What are they going to do about it? Solution? The United Nations? The European community? The European Union that is? and an explosion of centralized global institutions in business, banking, politics, etc., which were proposed and promoted to stop another war. Problem, reaction, solution. I'll give you another story here. Within that big problem, reaction, solution were endless smaller ones, and here's one. Between the First World War and the Second World War, 
Before anyone's talked about a second world war, a document came to light in America which had originated in London. Surprise, surprise. It was called Propaganda in the Next War. What next war? The war they knew was coming but weren't telling anyone else about yet. An American congressman held it up and said, what's this? No one listened, of course. And in, in a book called Anne the Truth Shall Set You Free, I've, I've listed word for word what it actually said in this document. But in summary, it said this. We're going to have a problem manipulating American public opinion to agree to take part in another war in Europe so soon after the last one. What we need, it said, is for another country to attack an American state, therefore creating the outrage that will take America into the war. And it says in this document, I kid you not, Japan would be perfect. 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Problem. Public reaction, outrage. Solution, America's in the war. And this is how these scams work and they're being played all the time. Isn't it funny that all these uh, horrors, and I'm not saying there were none, but these streaming horrors that were supposed to have happened in Kosovo, justifying the NATO invasion, are now being shown not to have happened. Problem, reaction, solution. And this is a wonderful example and solid, crystal clear proof that a few can control the planet. Question. How many people in America, in South Africa, in Britain, in France, in Germany even, yes, in Australia, and all these countries that took part in the Second World War, creating 55 million casualties, how many of the people who actually fought in it wanted to take part. A handful, maybe. vast majority of them, especially when they saw what war was, they wanted to be at home seeing their kids grow up. Most of them were flipping kids. So why did we take part in it? Why do we take part in these wars? Because a tiny hierarchy in this country manipulated its population to believe they had to fight this country. And the hierarchy in this country manipulated its population to believe they had to fight this country and these two hierarchies locked into the same hierarchy that was string pulling both sides. We call it war. And in the 60s there was a guy called Donovan, I met him in America recently, in Santa Fe, where he was singing at some uh, um, event. And, and he sang a song, it was written by a Canadian lady called Buffy St. Marie I think which sums up not just where the responsibility lies for this stuff, but where the power to stop it lies also. And it went like this. He's five foot two and he's six feet four. He fights with missiles and with spears. He's all of 31 and he's only 17. He's been a soldier for a thousand years. He's a Catholic, a Hindu, an atheist, a Jain, a Buddhist and a Baptist and a Jew. And he knows he shouldn't kill and he knows he always will. Killing for me, my friend, and me for you. And he's fighting for Canada, he's fighting for France, he's fighting for the USA. And he's fighting for the Russians and he's fighting for Japan. And he thinks we'll put an end to war this way. And he's fighting for democracy, he's fighting for the Reds, he says it's for the peace of all. He's the one who must decide who's to live and who's to die, and he never sees the writing on the wall. But without him, how could Hitler have condemned him at Laval? Without him, Caesar would have stood alone. He's the one who gives his body as a weapon of the war, and without him, all this killing can't go on. He's the universal soldier. He really is to blame. His orders come from far away no more. They come from here and there and you and me and brothers and sisters, can't you see? This is not the way we put the end to war. And if we could just remember one thing, we would bring so many elements of this crashing down. When we stop playing the game, there is no friggin' game. And we have the power to stop whenever we choose and we have the power to stop insisting that everyone else plays the game we choose to play. Those two things, this is over. The structure within which the um, 
world is manipulated also includes this technique which goes along with problem reaction solution. I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. James Madison. I call this the stepping stones approach. You know you go in there, but you know if you go in one leap to it, people are going to go, what's going on? What's going on? So you do it in little stepping stones. And this is how the European Union became um, the fascist state out of a free trade area. You do it in little steps, and every step is projected into the public arena as being completely unconnected to all the others. And eventually you get over there and you look back and you see how far you've come, and you say, I didn't agree to this, all you did, here, there, and to note the legislation, little bits. This is the stepping stones approach. That and problem reaction solution are the key manipulation techniques that have pushed this on over thousands of years. The structure of secret societies is compartmentalized levels of knowledge. You only go to the next level when you are chosen to have it. Until you do, you do not know the knowledge held by the next level above you. That very same structure is how the world's controlled. If you think of Russian dolls, you know where you get one doll inside another inside another? The structure that um, allows the world to be manipulated by a handful of people um, compared with the human population um, is pyramids inside bigger pyramids inside bigger pyramids and they're compartmentalized pyramids so no one knows what other people know the only people that know everything are these people at the top so if you take that to be a bank in the local branch in Froome the person you hand the check over to in the bank that person will not know what is being discussed in the bank manager's office behind them they won't know just doing their job, going home, looking after their families, getting on with their life. That bank manager will not know what's being decided at county level, at regional level. And so it goes on, compartmentalization of knowledge. And eventually, you get to the top of this bank, and only those few know the real score, the real agenda, and the real reason the bank's operating in the way it is. This bank will then go into the next pyramid. Eventually, you have the global banking system pyramid, which encompasses the whole of the banking system. And at the peak of that, you're looking at a handful of bloodline families controlling and manipulating that system. They're moving trillions of dollars a day around the financial markets. When the financial markets crash, it's because these geezers want them to crash. Nothing to do with... Um, the, uh, the stories we're given by highly paid economic correspondents who don't know their ass from their elbow of what's going on. To do with manipulating the system, crashing it. Why did James Goldsmith, one of the bloodlines, um, sell all his stocks just before the 1987 fire and stock market crash? Because he knew it was friggin' coming. Of course he did. Um, the transnational corporations are a compartmentalized pyramid. They go into the transnational corporation global network pyramid and at the peak of that they're controlled by the same bloodline families and they're the same families that control the banking system. And it's the same with politics, with education, with media at ownership level, etc. And, and, and with intelligence agencies. Down here they genuinely think the CIA, British intelligence, French intelligence are different organizations. At that point they are the same organization. Same with the secret societies. Um, the United Kingdom, like the United States and Germany and all these other free democracies, is a one-party state. But if it was an openly one-party state, we would be standing in a prison with bars you could see. Finite life. So we have to be given the illusion of political choice while the parties at the top are controlled by the same force because then we're in a prison with bars you cannot see infinite life until it's exposed. Um, and when you um, get to this level of politics, these people that knock on your door and say vote for Ethel, um, they genuinely think they're on different sides and in different parties and stand for different things. But when you get to this point, they fuse into the same um, force, the same controlling force. The present president of uh, America is a Democrat, it says here, called Clinton, who locks into the Rockefeller network. The more I see the, the research in America, there's a very good chance he is a Rockefeller about one generation back. Um, 
the Republican president before um, Clinton was George Bush, who locked into the Rockefeller network. And Ross Perot was set on the road to billionaire status um, by the Rockefeller network. One party state, but here we have to begin the illusion of multi-party states. I mean, if there is a difference between the British Conservative Party and the British Labour Party, except the Labour Party are further to the right, I'd like to see it. And this is the way it works, you see. The illusion. You'll, 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 you'll resonate with this um, bit, because we all kind of see it. You know, you get this thing where people say, doesn't matter who you put in power, the same things happen, nothing changes. Of course it doesn't. The illusion works like this. When you are the party in government, you have the power to introduce the agenda through legislation, so you do so. When you are the party in opposition, you do not have the power to introduce the agenda, so you oppose it. Then we have this farce called an election. And the government party becomes the opposition, and the opposition becomes the government. Now the opposition party is the government party and has the power to introduce the agenda. So it does so. The previous government party is now in opposition. It doesn't have the power to introduce the agenda anymore, so it opposes it. And this is why whoever's in government introduces the agenda, whereas whoever's not in government opposes it. We have the illusion of choice. Or oh, they're always fighting them politicians. Maybe not quite so much as we think they are. The other um, thing about these pyramid structures is um, presidents, prime minister, <clears throat> head of the World Bank, and these big positions in the world, Secretary General of NATO, you think that, um, or we're told and led to believe, that they're there at the peak of the pyramid of their particular structure of power. Nowhere near. They're here, and probably being optimistic. Um, they are uh, put into these positions of apparent power by those above them in this network that control the banks and the media, etc. And they are put in to administer into reality this agenda. These great powerful positions, yes, they have power over those below them, but they're just administrators of the agenda. And if they don't administer it, then they're out through various means. Um, and that's an important point to emphasize. When people like me start talking about this stuff, people go, he's a conspiracy theorist. <clears throat> well, first of all, most of this, like 90%, is no theory. It's supportable by the evidence. The evidence increasingly of our own eyes than anything else. And secondly, I ain't talking about a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. It's an agenda. It's an unfolding agenda over thousands of years for the complete takeover of planet Earth by certain bloodlines working through all races, particularly the white one. And where the conspiracy comes in is in three ways, which is why all these conspiracies are connected. Conspiracy number one, conspiring to remove those people and organizations that are a threat to that agenda becoming reality. Conspiracy two, conspiring to put into positions of apparent power, politically and financially, those who will make that agenda become reality. And conspiring, thirdly, to create events in the world like wars and Oklahoma to manipulate the population through problem-reaction-solution to demand that agenda becomes reality or see it as the only reaction to the problems that, that we're faced with. That's how the conspiracies connect, but it's an agenda at its heart, not a conspiracy. In, um, in the health section, you have the uh, pyramid situation. You have the transnational drug companies who have a wholly owned subsidiary called the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, in other words, the transnational drug companies, announced there's going to be a measles epidemic or something. The governments then um, spend taxpayers' money to put out fear-based black and white adverts, as they did in Britain a few years ago, saying, there's going to be a measles epidemic, World Health Organization says so, and do you know, as we see children in black and white playing ring a ring of roses in a, in a playground, one of these children will have died from measles by this time next year. Oh my God, 99.99% take up of that vaccination of measles a few years ago. And who provides the vaccine for transnational drug corporations who through the World Health Organization made the announcement in the first place? And what the hell is in that stuff that goes into a whole generation of children? 
This um, structure here is very, very important in the daily manipulation of the world. These are organizations that directly interface the Illuminati into politicians, into finance, into military, into um, intelligence agencies and stuff like that. In Britain, of course, um, in the last century, um, a secret society emerged called the Round Table. It was headed by a guy called Cecil Rhodes, um, who massively manipulated South Africa and after whom Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, was named. Uh, when Rhodes died in 1902, he left money to create something called Rhodes Scholarships, in which uh, students are um, given expenses paid um, uh, places at Oxford University uh, to be schooled in this whole thing, and then they go back to their countries, and the ratio of Rhodes Scholars who enter positions of significant power is enormous compared with the general population. The most famous Rhodes Scholar in the world today is Bill Clinton. Cecil Rhodes talked openly about wanting a world government based on Britain, which covertly is pretty much what we're heading towards. The leading round table members in uh, Britain were key players in the British War Cabinet in the First World War. The leading American members of the round table were the le leading members of the American War Cabinet in the First World War. In other words, they manipulated the First World War with all its horrors. After the war, when they were appointing people to the Versailles Peace Conference to decide how the world would be redrawn and changed as a result of that war, they appointed exactly the same people. And when they met at Versailles in 1919, they also met the Illuminati members, the Round Table members, at a place called the Hotel Majestic in Paris, and they started to orchestrate the creation of satellite organizations around this central core, which today are massively influential in advancing this agenda. Um, the first one was called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, based in London, very, very influential. People like Mendelssohn and stuff are members of that. And, um, it was set up in 1920. It started creating offshoot organizations around itself, like the Canadian Institute of International Affairs, and it created in 1921 an American arm, which is subordinate to the London one, called the Council on Foreign Relations. Since 1921, when that was formed, virtually every president, and the longer time has gone to the present day, the more this is the case, major administrator of government, um, ambassador, media um, people who are very influential in the media, etc., media owners have been members of the Council on Foreign Relations, a private organization. 1954 came the Bilderberg Group, um, set up at the Bilderberg Hotel in Oosterbeek, Holland in May 1954, headed from 54 to, to 76 by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, one of the bloodlines, and a big mate of Prince Philip. They run the Worldwide Fund for Nature together, which although the Worldwide Fund for Nature um, is massively supported by genuine people that want to save wildlife and the environment, what the Worldwide Fund for Nature is, is at that peak of its pyramid, at the level of Prince Philip and Prince Bernhard, it, it, it is a grotesque manipulator of Africa, particularly, a trainer of terrorists, a administrator of land where terrorists are trained and a manipulator of um, Africa and the African continent. And the last thing it is there for at that level is to save wildlife. And this answers another mystery which has kind of bamboozled and bewildered British people for so long. Why is the head of the World Wide Fund for Nature, Prince Philip, um, why does he find it such a wonderful pastime to blow wildlife out of the sky and shoot tigers and elephants and stuff, which he has in the past? Because he couldn't give a shit about wildlife. That's not what the Worldwide Fund for Nature is there for at that level. Although I emphasize there are many, many genuine people unknowingly working for it for what they, um, they believe are the right reasons. So the Bilderberg Group came in 54. The Trilateral Commission came in 1972, set up by the Rockefellers in America, that coordinates the agenda between America, Europe, and Japan. And the um, Club of Rome came in 1968, which has massively manipulated the environmental movement. Now, these organizations are different masks on the same face, and they have in their membership 
the top people in all the institutions that control the world. I'll give you an example of, of how this works. These are the hidden hands. How many people in Britain have heard of the Bilderberg Group? In America, anywhere around the world? The Bilderberg Group, what's that? Where? And I understand that. No one ever talks about it, really. Although it's coming out more and more as people uh, get more into this research. But I've talked to journalists about the Bilderberg Group. Bilderberg Group, what's that? I haven't got a bloody clue. But we don't want an informed journalistic profession. The people might know what's going on if they do. So, isn't it funny that the Bilderberg Group seems to be rather influential? Tony Blair, Bilderberg Group, Gordon Brown, Bilderberg Group, Peter Mandelson, Bilderberg Group, leading players in the present British government. Now, of course, the opposition chancellor uh, to um, Gordon Brown was Kenneth Clark, Bilderberg Group. Then you look at the last, uh, well, before I even say that, let's look at some more. Let's look at the Chancellor of Germany currently, Bilderberg Group. The previous one, Chancellor Cole, Bilderberg Group. Let's look at the head of the World Bank, James Wolfenson, Bilderberg Group. Let's look at the first two heads of the World Trade Organization, Peter de Sutherland of Ireland and Renato Ruggiero of Italy, Bilderberg Group. Wherever you look, this thing comes up and no one's ever friggin' heard of it, apart from a few people. The last six Secretary Generals of NATO, the biggest military force in the world, and it's more than this, but let's just take the last six. Joseph Lunds, Bilderberg Group. Lord Carrington, Bilderberg Group. Manfred Werner, Bilderberg Group. Vili Clace, Bilderberg Group. Javier Solana, the guy whose face was all over the screen during Kosovo, Bilderberg Group. The new one, the British guy, George Robertson, Bilderberg Group. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. And I can't give you a better example of all that I'm saying here than Bosnia and Kosovo. Bosnia and Kosovo were manipulated wars to create an effect, an end. Many smaller effects, but one major one. To advance the agenda massively of NATO becoming the world army and the world police force. Bosnia was manipulated into place, not least through an organization based in America called Kissinger Associates, headed, of course, by Henry Kissinger, one of the great manipulators of the 20th century on behalf of this elite. His big buddy is Lord Carrington. Of course, Lord Carrington, the bloodline lord of uh, Britain, who was just happened to be foreign secretary when the mistakes were made that led to the Falklands War. Now, if you, and he resigned because he's an honourable man, you know. Very honourable, these lords, you know. Very honourable indeed. People make mistakes. Okay, fine, we do. We have learning experiences. Fine. But if you've just made mistakes which you've admitted to, which led to the Falklands War, you might keep that guy away from military things for a little while, might you? You might think about it. They made him Secretary General of NATO because it's not what he is in terms of what we see. It's what he knows and what he is in terms of the Illuminati. Now, Lord Carrington was a founding director of Kissinger Associates that manipulated the Bosnian conflict. When the Bosnian conflict started, the status quo reaction to these events was the UN peacekeeping operation. If that had worked, great. From my point of view, from the Illuminati's point of view, nightmare. No advancement of agenda. So, when those horrific pictures were coming out of Bosnia, and pulling at our emotions, the UN peacekeeping operation was being systematically exposed as inadequate and useless. So what came? Something must be done, this can't go on, what are they going to do about it? Solution? A 60,000 strong NATO world army, the biggest multinational force assembled since the Second World War. Problem, reaction, solution. So, when they played stage two of this scam called Kosovo, there was no mention of a UN peacekeeping response to Kosovo. It was immediately NATO because Bosnia had flicked the status quo. So we take that and let's look at this. The first peace negotiator appointed in Bosnia by the European Union to stop the conflict was Lord Carrington, President of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chairman of the Bilderberg Group from 1991 to the present day, Trilateral Commission member. The conflict wasn't stopped. I stand back in amazement. He was replaced by the European Union as peace negotiator by another Lord, Lord David Owen, Bilderberg Group Trilateral Commission. 
He was replaced when the conflict went on by the former Swedish Prime Minister Carl Bildt, Bilderberg Group. At the same time, the United Nations was appointing peace negotiators in Bosnia. The first one of which was Cyrus Vance, Bilderberg Group Trilateral Commission Council on Foreign Relations. They replaced him with a Norwegian, Thorvald Stoltenberg. No matter what country they come from, same coordinating body. Thorvald Stoltenberg, Trilateral Commission, Bilderberg Group. The conflict went on. So, along comes Jimmy Carter, as an independent peace negotiator. Jimmy Carter, first Trilateral Commission President of the United States, Council on Foreign Relations member. The conflict went on. By this time, the horrors of Bosnia had manipulated humanity's response to the point where the sting could be played. Onto the scene came Richard Holbrook, Bill Clinton's peace envoy, to negotiate the so-called Dayton Agreement that put the 60,000 strong world army in place. Richard Holbrook, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations. He answered to the then Secretary of State in America during the Bosnian conflict, Warren Christopher, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, and the Defense Secretary in America, William Perry, Bilderberg Group, and they answered to the President Bill Clinton, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations. And he answered to the unelected uh, David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger, leading executives of these organizations. And the media won't tell you about this, not because, at least because most journalists never heard of the Bilderberg Group. It's hilarious. Journalists about time we had some. I remember Gandhi was once asked what he thought of Western civilization. And he said, I think it would be a very good idea. <laughs> I think the same about journalism and education. Let's have some. Anyway, the other reason the media won't tell you about this is because, for instance, the Washington Post, one of the most influential newspapers in America, owned, at least officially, by Catherine Graham, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, ABC, CBS, uh, NBC, the three television networks in America, all owned and controlled by members of these organizations. The Hollinger Group, which owns Telegraph newspapers in Britain, which owns a string of newspapers in America. 68% of newspapers in Canada now. It owns the Jerusalem Post and goodness knows how many others worldwide. That little lot, including Telegraph newspapers, is owned by British intelligence. We're free, honey. During the last war, World War, there was an elite aspect of British intelligence called the Special Operations Executive. It created a front organization for itself called War Supplies Limited, and the two agents that set it up were Edward Plunkett Taylor and a guy called George Montague Black. After the war, they kept it going as a front for British intelligence, but because it was called War Supplies Limited, they had to change its name. So they changed its name to the Argus Corporation. More recently, they've changed it from the Argus Corporation to the Hollinger Group, which owns Telegraph newspapers and all that other stuff. The Hollinger Group today is headed by Conrad Black, the son of George Montague Black, the British agent that set the whole thing up. And Conrad Black is not just a member of the Bilderberg Group, he's one of its inner core elite and hosted its meeting at King City, Toronto in 1996. We're free, honey. Now, um, as I was saying, um, this is Henry. He's a nice man, Henry, you know, very good to his mother, never goes home. Um, when I started researching Henry Kissinger, I immediately, instinctively knew that cloning was a fact, because this guy's everywhere. And I tell you, if Henry Kissinger and Lord Carrington arrive in your country, it's time to run bloody fast for the travel agent, because all hell's about to break loose. Ask the people of South Africa, of Burundi, of Rwanda, etc. Have you had enough of that picture? It's horrible, isn't it? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> What are we doing letting these geezers run the bloody planet? Let's get off our asses and sort this out. It's ridiculous. Now, in the, um, just coming to an end to this before we look at solutions, and my goodness me, they're there. Um, we're just going to do two slides for each administration of the last four in America, just to give you an idea of this one party state. And I emphasize. The two slides are only a selection of people in these administrations who are members of these organizations I've just been talking about. 1976, Jimmy Carter's a Democrat, peanut farmer. I'm going to give that nice Jimmy Carter a go, you know, because I live in the land of the free and, and, I, I, and he seems nice to me, so I'm going to vote for him. We're going to have a democratic government, I like that. So, the Carter administration, 
It is awash with members of the CFRTC, Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral Commission, all the way through. More Carter. Like I say, this is just a selection. There's streams and streams of these people in these administrations. Ambassadors in the Carter administration. You can't become an ambassador in America unless you're a member of the Council on Foreign Relations now, a private organization. So, 1980. Well, I want to, please, with that Jimmy Carter, that Democrat, and I live in the land of the free, and so I've got choice, so I'm going to vote for that Republican bloke, um, Ronald Reagan, this time, because he's different. Well, the Reagan administration, he was a non-member, he didn't have to be, did he? He read the order queue, Ron, but he was a member of other Illuminati organizations that lock into the network, like the Knights of Malta and Bohemian Grove, etc. But now, look at Reagan's special advisors to the NATO Security Council, David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger, two of the greatest manipulators of the 20th century. Um, down through different names now, because this is Republican C, all the same coordinating bodies. More Reagan. I say Reagan, uh, George Bush had three terms as president, two of them officially designated to Reagan. So after the second term, because they can only have two in America, along came George Bush for his third term, the first one official. He changed the administration a bit, same coordinating bodies, more George Bush. So you get to 1992. Well, then Republicans don't seem to do much, and so I'm going to I'm going to vote for that nice man Clinton because I think we ought to have Democrats because then they might be different because Clinton said he stands for change. Well, to this day, Bill Clinton, who's got the full set, um, has in his Democratic administration the same coordinating bodies for the people he appoints that um, you've seen all along, and this is the way it works. This is what we're seeing how the prison without bars is created and orchestrated so we have the illusion, the movie screen of freedom and choice while actually the same force is manipulating an agenda through all sides. So what can we do about it? Well the answer is we are the people in our lifetimes who are going to bring this bloody nonsense to an end because it's only there because of us. There's two ways of um, trying to bring an end to something you don't like. One is to find a solution, and my goodness me, we're drowning in them. And there's another, which I prefer, which is removing the cause of the problem. You know, <clears throat> you can pour fire, or you can pour water, or pour fire if you like, if you're off your bloody head, but you can pour water onto something that's burning on a gas stove. Or, you can turn the gas off. I think turning the gas off is rather more efficient. And that's what we can do and is starting to happen around the world. At the heart of removing the cause of the problem is for us to take power back instead of giving it away to other people. And taking power back means taking responsibility back. They're the same thing and also the very heart of removing the cause of the problem is for us to start to remember who we are and the nature of life itself. The magnificent immensity, the awesome nature of who we really are. There is not an ordinary man, woman, child, breath of air, drop of rain, blade of grass on this planet but there are billions who believe they are, so that's the life they manifest. But if we know different, we can manifest something very different. We can talk about Bilderberg groups and Knights of Malta and Freemasons and bloody shape-shifting reptilians, and we should. We need to know what's going on. But the very foundation that has allowed this to happen and continues to allow it to happen has been the suppression of knowledge of who we are and the nature of life. That's why that ancient knowledge was destroyed systematically. To disconnect us from any understanding that we're not ordinary, never have been, never will be. And that we are, in truth, minute by minute, in control of our own destiny. See, one of the other oppo-sames that's projected as opposites is religion and science, you see. And yet, they're the same thing. And it's interesting. You can see how the Illuminati manipulated religion, but how did this world is all there is, life's a bitch and then you die, science get involved here? 
the idea that we're a cosmic accident that's come from oblivion, we have like a few seconds or a hundred years, if we're lucky, of um, kind of some kind of consciousness, and then we go back to oblivion. God, it's money for old rope, isn't it? You know, putting that stuff out. We don't have a very depressing no. No, we just we just go from oblivion to oblivion. It's very, very clear, very simple, you know, very primitive. Where did that get foisted on the world from? Answer, overwhelmingly an organization based in London called the Royal Society, whose official history says it was created by Freemasons. Another group that created the Royal Society that put this stuff on the world, this world is all there is, you know, it's just all a cosmic accident, worthless, was a group called the Lunar Society. And the Lunar Society was named because it met on the full moon every month because it knew that the moon at full moon is reflecting very powerful energy compared with the rest of the cycle at the Earth and so there's lots of energy to work with. This is why they do their rituals at full moon. And, and, and that's positive people work with energy at full moon as well as for those that wish to be malevolent. It's just knowledge. It's not good and bad, it just is. It's how you use it. On this lunar society, which became the Royal Society, was Josiah Wedgwood of the Wedgwood Pottery family, Benjamin Franklin, the Henry Kissinger of his day who never went home, and the grandfather of Charles Darwin, the father to, of Charles Darwin. And this lunar society, who friggin' knew the esoteric knowledge and knew this world that wasn't all there was, then used the, the, the son, Charles Darwin, as the front man to give more emphasis and credence to the fact that it's all a cosmic flipping accident and it's survival of the fittest. And what they've disconnected us from is this, that there are two streams of evolution going on here. There's the evolution of the physical form passed on through genetics, and then there's the evolution of the eternal infinite consciousness that incarnates into that physical form. They're not the same thing. They want us to think they are, however, because then we will re won't realize who we really are. Everything that exists. We're like, we're like, an, we're like droplets of water in an ocean of infinite consciousness. And if you, if you look at an ocean, it's made up of droplets. Every droplet may appear to be a droplet when you hold it in your hand, but every droplet is the ocean because it's connected to the rest of the ocean. What the Illuminati have sought to do is to put it in those eggshells so we disconnect from the ocean and...